Welcome to SciShow Tangents. It's the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me this week, as always, is science expert, Sari Riley. Hello. Our resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hello. And this week, we have a special guest, artist, botanist, photographer, and self-described mad scientist. It's Tyler Thrasher! What up? Tyler, how are you? I'm doing great. Um, doing really great. I'm in Chicago right now for an art show. It was a good show, having some time off with the family. Um, so I'm doing really great. Thanks for having me. Tyler, if you, if you don't know, does a number of things, but he's maybe most famous for diagnosing what's wrong with your plant, which usually is you. <laughs> <laughs> you, he's not particularly <laughs> kind about it uh and you are the reason your plant died so yes. Tyler, uh what's the what's the most common way i killed my plant <laughs> i mean here's the thing it always comes down to like a couple things like you're not watering enough you're not okay you're not paying attention that's the thing it always comes down to <laughs> which sounds it sounds mean I, no, it's, I've, I've it had, sounds very ag- – that's true of almost everything <laughs> that goes wrong in my life. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very simple. Just pay attention, take some notes, and then hopefully you're one step better than you were yesterday. That's I – th- I think it's simple. I think it's an easy fix. <laughs> you're, saying, you're saying that I have to look to, – to think about the plant? It's a plant. Yeah. They do it on their own outside all the time. Yeah, but once you bring them indoors, then all of a sudden you're responsible for it. You took them away from the one thing they knew, the outdoors. <laughs> That's true. Oh, my God. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird that us as a whole separate animal is like, we're going to take this whole other living organism, move it clear across the globe, and try to grow yeah. them in little terracotta pots where they don't belong. Yeah. We're, we're a weird, weird species. Oh, very weird. <laughs> Well, it worked really good for like cats and dogs, you know? Yeah, it took some time though. We had to work hard at that to turn mm. dogs into dogs. And think a lot about them. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Also, I will say, you think more about your dog than your plant. Yeah, plants will poop all over your floor and barf and stuff. Yeah, if I engaged as much with my cat as my plants, I would have a oh, big problem. Sh- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those, yeah, the stakes are a little higher with a with yeah. pet. <laughs> yeah. I once uh, found a ficus in Rattlesnake Creek here in Missoula, Montana, and I thought to myself, I will save this ficus <laughs> in a Montana creek. A ficus, tropical plant. It was Montana out there. I pulled it in. It was a little icy, and I put it in my bathtub, and I was convinced <laughs> that I would save this ficus. And I think really, I was in school at the time, and I think I needed something to write about for a class. <laughs> I think it was ultimately what it came down to. Um, Tyler, can you alleviate my guilt at having failed at this task? <clears throat> no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's, that's your task. Um, no, <laughs> look, okay, I can. I can. I can okay. one-up you. Um, so it happens. We, we just plants die and we, you know, completely against our best efforts, we're trying to maintain a living organism that's very complex. Um, and and we're going to kill a lot of plants. Plants, they, they, I mean, they die all the time. And, uh, to one up you, I had someone give me a plant that was about 40 years old and it had survived two growers. It was a conophytum obcordellum, which is a very, very intriguing, tricky uh, succulent to grow. And I killed it within the first month of having this plant that uh, oh. outlived outlived two of its growers. Oh, um, it's not that was, the growers like gave up, and had, but they literally, the, the people died. They died. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> they died. I mean, if and, it's going to go one way or the other, I'd prefer you survive. <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. So, yeah, I mean... I'm I'm haunted by two old botanists at least, so I, <laughs> I, I think you'll be okay. <laughs> so every week here on SciShow Tangents, we get together to try to one-up, amaze, and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic. Our panelists are playing for glory, but they're also playing for Hank Bucks, which we'll be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, one of us will be crowned the winner. Now, because we have a special guest, we're going to have two games. I will be playing along with our panelists. And as always, we're going to introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem. This week, it's from Tyler. I made a little haiku about crystals. Just a little little haiku. Okay. To restrain chaos in a universe so wild to be a crystal. 
Well, that that's, was yeah, a nice that's haiku. That's all you need, really. Nice. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's like legit. <laughs> that's legit. Snaps. Made you think about the the object. Made you think about yourself. That's and like the universe. And the, the universe. So the universe. The, is, don't forget. Sorry, I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition to doing uh, plant stuff, Tyler also grows crystals on bugs because it's cool. Uh, <laughs> and so our topic for the day is crystals, and it really does seem like they are order coming from. Nothing. We know that the universe does not find order on its own. So there's something deeper going on, of course. There's, <laughs> there, there, there's, there, it, entropy wants to entropy no matter what. But crystals seem to be fighting against this. So there must be something going on. They're very cool. I love them very much. The, you know, being in a cold place is nice because you get to find them all the time. Found a bunch at the river recently where it looked like snow had fallen. But in fact, just it had grown on the ground and it was spiky. I loved it. But Sari, can you tell me what a crystal is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the way that they fight against entropy is that molecules and atoms and ions are all seeking for little pockets of stability. Like, aren't, aren't we all? Um, <laughs> and the, a, a crystal or a crystalline solid is a material where those atoms or molecules are arranged in a very ordered microscopic structure oftentimes because they've had the like time and space to do it or because there are just so many of them packed together that it is easiest. I'm going to use easiest as like a chemical wiggly mm-hmm. word <laughs> for them <laughs> to assemble. They're falling downhill into it, you know? Kind yeah. Of the, that's sort of, it's, it's, it's like just, it's cozy. You're locking together. It's energetically more favorable if you want to use the mm-hmm. more technical words for them to lock into this a uh, regular patterned structure. So like we talk about something is a crystal, something is amorphous, uh, like glass is amorphous where mm. the the faces are wibbly and and rounded and all the molecules are kind of parting in there as opposed <laughs> to a crystal <laughs> where everyone is in a row in their designated cubby spot bonded to the others they're at work uh-huh. stock Instead still of party they're at work <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and materials can fall within these two extremes on this on the scale mm. so something can be more crystalline which is more ordered or something can be more amorphous which is more disordered so like the big crystals that you see the really pretty ones with surface faces that are aligned to the like the internal symmetry and that are sheared along those faces. So if you like take a piece of pure calcite um, and and break it along a face, then you're going to get a, a rhomboid shape, a rhombus type shape. And no matter how many times you break it, it will always break along those same lines of symmetry. Mm. And it feels like in order to do that, you would need like the same thing over and over again. But in fact, crystals can form with mixtures of different things. Like a ruby, I think, is like one thing with some other things in it. And regularly, though, which is very cool. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, even think like quartz, where you have all these different variations, like amethyst and citrine. And you get all of these, like, in a lab setting, you'd call them contaminants. But that's what gives them their beautiful colors, are these, like, added right. minerals, like, you know, cobalt and chromium, um, iron, uh, stuff like that. I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> I could have said anything. <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems right. Uh, what and what is quartz? Like, what's the root uh, element? Silica. Okay. Silicon dioxide. Um, oh, so it's not an element. It's a. It's a. It's a molecule. Yeah. So it's molecule. And what's also really interesting, like you're talking about amorphous um, structures. One of my favorite mineraloids slash amorphous structures is opal. And opal and quartz and glass, they all have a lot of the same um, um, components. But, you know, you have one that's crystalline and one that's amorphous. um, And they have two very distinctly different appearances and interactions with light um, and durability. Um, Mm. So even with very similar roots, like um, their base atoms and molecules, I mean, you could get just a wide range of materials that we ooh and ah at and wear around our bodies. And where does crystal come from? The word. 
The word crystal, the word as opposed to what? Uh, <laughs> the crystals, <sorry. laughs> which come from the ground. <laughs> yes, they come from the dirt. The word also, we just un- unburied it. But the first crystals that we really started being fascinated with were quartz, um, like the ones that Tyler was mentioning. The, the quartz that is uncontaminated, I guess, is almost like a pure, translucent, whitish sheen um and so it looks almost like ice in that way ice Mm -hmm. ice crystals are also crystals um to be clear but then quartz was like harder ice in some way Uh, and so uh in greek they took the word cryos which means frost and then came up with the word crystallos which means crystal or ice and then we mm. we kind of extrapolated from there. So quartz was the first crystal, I think, that we called a crystal because it, it looked similar enough. And we're like, what is this mm. extra, extra hard ice? Um, <laughs> That's awesome. It's not even cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that thought process. That really works for me. Yeah. And then and then they were like, you know, like how you put ice on your muscles to make them feel better. Put crystals on places. Just do uh-huh. that. It's got to be a thing, right? And then you get going to the Oh, that's a, oh man, that's a... That is a wormhole. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can play a game now. <laughs> and that means it's time for us to move on to the quiz portion of our show. This week, we're going to be playing a little true or fail hosted by me. One of the popular, the less scientific images surrounding crystals is that of a crystal ball, the mystical sphere that can reveal more about you and the past and the present and the future. Crystal balls. I uh, mean, not really work, but crystals have been very useful uh, for scientists to understand things about how our world works. The following are three stories of scientific discoveries rooted in crystals, but only one of them is true. Story number one, humans, even ancient migratory war- ones, have always needed to take pit stops to relieve themselves. So researchers <laughs> studying the movement of ancient groups across Southern Europe have started to look for large crystals that would have originated with human urine to identify caves that they should investigate further. Or it could be story number two. There are plenty of good reasons to go to Iceland, but for scientists who crystallize proteins so that they can understand their structures, the best reason might be that a salt naturally found in Iceland's Blue Lagoon has been found to accelerate the crystallization process. Or it might be story number three. Volcano eruptions are difficult to predict, but scientists studying Mount Etna have analyzed crystals that grow inside of the magma, and they found a way to use their structure to help us predict volcanic eruptions in the future. It has to be one of those three, even though they all seem pretty outlandish. So did researchers use pea crystals to find evidence of ancient humans? (laughs) Does Iceland have salt that speed up the crystallization of proteins? Or do scientists use crystals in magma to predict volcanic eruptions oh shit (laughs) okay you're not supposed to know by the way that's important there's no way anyone so i have been to iceland i have been to iceland but that does not help me at all how how are your proteins feeling (laughs) yeah did you feel like it sped up the crystallization within you (laughs) (laughs) it can't be the p right why can't it be the p that's the one that i feel like maybe is the most I feel drawn to the pea. To the pea? Yeah. That's yeah. a lot of pea, my dude. They don't have to be big crystals. Just little crystals. If everyone peed on the same rock, like if you had 50 yeah. friends, how many friends would you need to pee on the same rock for it to be like, ugh, that's a lot of pee. That Just like a oh. slagmite of crystal. Of, of okay, my, but my follow-up question is, is like, how do we know that? I mean, what's left over for us to analyze and say, this is human pea. Yeah, you know, oh. like, why couldn't it be? That's a point for sure. But that I don't know. Maybe yeah. We got... Our pee's got to be a little different. If this was happening, then there'd be pee crystals everywhere because every animal's pee would be turned into. And crystals. their diets were so much better. Like, mm-hmm. is their pee mm-hmm. how distant different. is their pee from our pee? <laughs> I don't I, like you judging my diet, Tyler. My, what are you there's saying? microplastics I had, I had a, in my pee. <laughs> yeah, he's got corn dog particles in his pee. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I think the part of pee that crystallizes, if I had to take a gander at it, is the urea, because I think that's like what organic chemists early on crystallized and Mm. were like, I can, I'm crystallizing urea with 
I'm not a kidney. I crystallized it. I did chemistry. Mm. <laughs> Sounds like they're having a lot of fun doing it, too. <laughs> they're having a great time. Wahoo! <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think it's the mag. I think it's the volcanoes. Those are hot crystals. I kind of think it is, too. I mean, at the rate of crystallization, I mean, couldn't you check, like, ongoing deposits and then see, like, what crystals had tarnished or which ones were larger? And, I mean, if this volcano erupts frequently, I mean, you could check different crystal deposits and gauge the period between the crystal deposits and go, oh, this is the time in between different little crystal deposits. I don't know. <laughs> uh-huh. Is is Mount Etna active? Is it an active volcano? Yes. Can you tell us that? Yes, it is. Mm. I believe you. <laughs> Tyler, that was very persuasive. <laughs> yeah. I, I believe me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Would there be a special salt that could speed up crystallization? Does that even sound like... I think that's kind? that sounds so fake to me <laughs> that I'm just writing it right off. There's too many people in the Blue Lagoon. It's yeah, just, it's sweat. It's human sweat. Yeah, yeah. Or it's Or Pete. Pete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go for pea crystals just to switch it up, just to diversify our our guesses. And because I think I want to know. So you got to be wrong though. I'm going with volcano. I, I think. All I think right. That just, that just rings true to me. Yeah. And Tyler's already locked in. Like he was. He was locked in <laughs> five minutes he ago. Gave he gave an He was yeah. very certain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there is a compound in P that is not. Shit. Urine. That means I'm wrong. That crystallizes. Uh, it's called struvite, and uh, it turns into crystals in specifically in low oxygen areas, which is not what caves are. And researchers have been studying struvite because it may be able to act as a slow release fertilizer for seagrass. So that's not the one. Sorry, Terry. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> the first, the, the first, but the first protein crystals were described by biologists in the 19th century, and they were uh, of worm and fish hemoglobin. And protein crystallization mm-hmm. has gone on to be very important in helping scientists purify and study all sorts of important proteins. But the salts of Iceland's Blue Lagoon do not have any relevance to protein crystallization. You all Thank call goodness. that one no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations to Tyler and Sam. Mount Etna all right, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, a very active volcano, one of the most active volcanoes in the world. And researchers studying it have been using a type of crystal found in the magma called antichrists to see if they can Whoa. figure out signs that an eruption is going to happen soon. While we know that new magma entering into a volcano reservoir usually happens before an eruption, the complex routes that move magma around make it really hard to predict exactly if and when a volcanic eruption will happen. So, Antichrists are crystals found in magma, but whose origins are actually much old in like much older magma than the magma they've been found in. Over time, they grow different layers that reflect the magma that surrounds them. So by studying the structure of the antichrists with lasers, researchers can understand more about the volcano's history. For example, Whoa. old antichrist cores form a rim around the crystal when they are carried to the surface of fresh magma. And using the thickness of those rims and other features of the crystal, researchers are learning more about the timing between new batches of magma showing up and then the subsequent eruption afterward. It's pretty Whoa, cool. cool. So they like just have like cool. a little history of where they've been inside of magma chambers. It's like a pocket of time is what it is. It's like it's like time ordered. That's that's pretty cool. It's that's like it's cool. like tree rings, but a magma. And if you want to look it up, it's A N T E C H R Y S T S. It took me yeah. three tries, and uh. I got Antichrist <laughs> multiple times. That's I'm still getting the Antichrist, even when I search it the way you said. <laughs> oh, well. I'll find it later. Yeah, I, I don't think that they're like. Uh, I don't think that they look like good. And fun to own one, mm. <laughs> unless you know about it. I think otherwise you're like that looks like kind of a boring little rock, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of one of the best things where people are like, "Why do you have that boring little rock in such a prized place?" And I'm like, "It shows the history of the volcanic <laughs> magma movement through all the chambers of Mount Etna. They're yeah. gone by the time you got that far into your sentence." <laughs> <laughs> they're they're back getting another piece of cheese. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Sam and Tyler have one. Sari is headed into the next round with nothing. We're gonna take a short break though, 
And then it'll be time for a game from Sam. Welcome back, everybody. Time to play another game for us. Uh, but I don't know what it is. But Sam Schultz does. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that great introduction. That was amazing. Researching crystal facts is really hard. Google pretty much only shows you healing crystals and a lot of other crystal science is. And now I feel embarrassed saying this. Kind of boring. So I really rolled up my sleeves. <laughs> Sam. Down, right? Bro. Down, <laughs> to the bottom of the barrel to make a game that I call... <laughs> Are you, <laughs> are you roasting on crystal? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Let me say the name of my game. It's called Okay, okay hit it. Salty, sweet, or sand. Uh, so, <laughs> so if you lick it, it's one of those three flavors. Yeah. That would have been better, I guess, than what I came up with. Of all crystals, okay. salt, sugar, and sand are probably the most accessible. There's probably sand, sugar, or salt in the room with you right now. And on top of that, Heck, they all kind of look the same. So in this sort of this or that style game, possibly the worst game in Tangent's history, I will present you with a fact, and you will tell me whether salt, sugar, or sand are the main character of the fact. If you get it, you get a point. If none of you get it, I get uh, maybe like, let's say three points. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay, Sam is going to run away with it. Uh, here's a softball for you. The game of golf as we know it dates back to at least 1470. Damn, <laughs> <laughs> the game of golf as we know it dates back to at least 1457, but reusable golf tees, uh, as we know them on the other hand, have only been around since 1892 when the Perfectum was invented, and the Perfectum was like a proto tee. It was a metal spike with some rubber nubs on it that would hold your ball, but people still had to keep their ball from rolling away in those intervening 400-ish years. So which crystalline grain would golfers pour on the ground to make a little makeshift tee for themselves? Salt, it's sugar, gotta be, or sand. It's gotta be, it's gotta be <laughs> sand. Gosh, you'd think so, wouldn't you? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but your response almost yeah, changed no. my answer. I, I feel... <laughs> yeah, he was. That was very convincing, Sam. We cannot overthink this. I will not overthink this after overthinking the piss con the, the question. <laughs> so I'm going to say it's sand. <laughs> it's got to be. No, you're not wasting good good old salt or sugar. Mm. On. Why would you even have it? No. Drum some so, chips on the ground, then golf? No. What was the time frame <laughs> we're talking about here? Between 1457 and 1892. I'm thinking like tea parties, you know, mm. like I think they took ah. the little sugar cubes and crushed it up and, and just sprinkled that down in there. Because he was walking around with a little baggie of sand, you know? Um, I fully support you in your incorrect <laughs> guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I don't think I'm gonna say it's. I mean, it's obviously got to be s s sand. If it's sugar cubes, just put just stack two of them up, and then you got a T. <laughs> yeah, it's sand, obviously. Hey, yeah, the earliest you, days Hank. of golf, golfers would kind of just dig a hole in the ground and get all the mud and like make it into a little pyramid and put the the ball on top of it. But digging holes all over golf courses is not a good idea. So golf courses started providing crates of wet sand that golfers could clump up and make a little tee for their ball. <laughs> uh, but then by, by 1922, we had the tee as we know it now. And in the meantime, there was some other that stuff. That took too. a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really hard to figure well, yeah. out, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, and then you had like yeah. sandy fingers for the rest. Yeah. Like, and sand you, like... all over the golf course. What are you doing? Yeah, it's a mess. Okay, Giant ready boxes. For this one? Number two. Yes. Ice skating is a beloved wintertime activity, but sometimes people want to skate when it's not cold out too, or they don't live next to a suitably frozen body of water. And that's where I indoor ice rinks come in. The first of these ice rinks, named the Glaciarium, was opened in London in 1844. <laughs> However, it wasn't filled with frozen water, but a proprietary concoction made out of pig lard. <laughs> and which of these grains of crystal, salt, sugar, or sand? Pig lard? Yeah. <laughs> it did, wasn't ice? I don't even think it was cold. <laughs> it was just butter? <laughs> my, my goodness. This does not mesh with my understanding of chemistry. I think you can make a, a flat surface out of either sugar or salt, but because there are those salt bricks that they cook fish on, like those big pink salt uh -huh. things, I think you can make a surface 
and then butter it up, and then people can <laughs> slip slide, slip and slide around. Oh shit! And have a good time. So salt I, is my guess. I my brain rebels at the idea of sugared lard so much <laughs> that I'm going to say salt. Uh, yeah, was this during war times? Uh, this was in 1844. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't, no, I don't I think mean, so. <laughs> I just, I'm, th- I'm just thinking like you wouldn't use sugar. Like I feel like you would save sugar for like. Uh, I think it's, I troops. think it's salt. My answer is salt. Yeah, we're I think all going with salt. salt. So Sam's got a good chance here. Damn it, it's salt and salt. Uh, <laughs> so this place had a floor covered with salt and pig fat mixture, which was apparently just hard and slippery, and slippery enough to skate on somehow. It wasn't frozen because they didn't have large scale refrigeration back then. But the place smelled so bad that it closed within a year of opening. People would just be like, sicked out. Makes sense. <laughs> you fall down, you can get a little lick on the floor. A little snack. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> I'm, looking at, I'm looking at the, the Glacierium, and they're all dressed like in their fancy fancies. Yeah. Skating Ooh. around. So, you know, you yeah. like get home and you, you're like, your fancy dress smells like that. Well. <laughs> Number three, in 2018, about 650 goats were airlifted out of Olympic National Park after they started getting dangerously close to campsites and trails in search of which little crystal that they had become addicted to, sugar, salt, or sand. That's it's, salt. It's got to be salt. They want to, they crave that mineral. They crave there was that a mineral. whole meme about this. <laughs> so remember Tumblr? <sighs> <laughs> I was so online during this period of my life. I <laughs> yeah, but they can get salt any old place, huh? I think it's sugar. Sugar is hor- horribly a- a- addictive. I mean, it's probably one of the most addictive substances we all consume. Regu- I think it's I, sugar. I definitely have a problem. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, we came to we came to our conclusions quickly, Sam. The answer is salt, and it is in fact salt from human urine. So sometimes when you're hiking, oh. you got to take a whiz, and that whiz is full of salt. And goats, as Sari said, crave that mineral. So they travel <laughs> far and wide naturally to lick salty rock deposits. But why climb up the side of a sheer rock wall to lick a rock <laughs> when you can go to the trails where humans are peeing all over the place and lick the ground where the pee was? Sounds like a pretty good plan, except wow. the goats started to get a little too rowdy, and they would dig big holes all over the place trying to get more of that sweet piss. Uh, and these holes weren't great for the landscape. So in 2018, their behavior had gotten so out of hand that the goat population in Olympic National Park was reduced by blindfolding and airlifting groups of goats to other parts of the Washington wilderness. Oh, my gosh. It all comes back to pee. I don't know if they blindfolded them because so they didn't want them to see where they were going or because they'd be scared or what. But I think they'd be scared. I think that's probably it. I'm, I'm mostly like, can we just like blindfold everybody's pee holes instead like <laughs> come on people <laughs> make everybody wear a diaper you got the real when they're problem hiking. here is humans <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you're causing a problem oh i'm gonna call it diapers pee hole blind now i mean pee hole blindfold yeah a urethral blindfold jesus all right, here's my last one. I'll put you out of your misery. Way back in ancient times, there were some interesting ideas about how to cure ailments. Like, for instance, a certain type of medicine for treating broken bones was made out of the corpses of humans who willfully ate only and then were buried in a solution of which of these tiny little crystals? We got, you got to pickle that boy. You got to make him into jerky. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you wouldn't survive very long. Eat. I guess that's not the point. Eat salt. I guess you just eat a bunch of chips. You eat a bunch of pickles and then you get pickled. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's how it works. Or you could eat a bunch of candy and get candied. A la Willy Wonka. <laughs> yeah. That's what happened to Augustus Glue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I want to say sugar because we haven't had a sugar yet. So I, I, I don't know. Has there really I, been no sugar? Oh. I don't think there's been any sugar. I think you could keep someone alive longer if you feed them sugar and then turn them into a lollipop. <laughs> so I'm going to say that, sugar. I don't like metagaming, so I'm going to stick with my original answer because I think that salt was more around. All right, this one's kind of a stretch, and I deeply apologize, but what I'm referring to here is millified man, a medicine documented in ancient Greek and Chinese literature that was made out of the dead bodies of people, generally holy men, who, towards the end of their lives, ate only honey until they died, 
Then they had their bodies placed in a coffin full of honey until they basically ah. became candy cadavers. And then they were sold as medicine. Honey is, of course, made of sugar, I think. Hell yeah. Right? <laughs> Realistically, speaking, <laughs> Realistically yeah. speaking, we know that some cultures did embalm their dead with honey. But it seems a little up in the air whether or not this was an actual medicine anybody used. Or maybe if it worked or not. Because who knows? You know? Mm. Maybe you could fix your broken bones. Yeah, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's a lot of honey. I that is a lot of that's a lot of that's a that's a lot that's of honey a huge yeah. must have been very valuable to get a little bit of this powdered honey man <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, people had a lot more free time to hang out their bees back then too so that's true that's true honey around. that's true and also like you're gonna eat the honey one way or the other you might as well put a little dead guy in it just for- <laughs> 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 all right that's the end of my game <laughs> <laughs> that one's very weird. Did you like it? <laughs> I did. Yeah, I did. Well, yeah, it was a good. It was a good game, Sam. We have ended up somehow in the bizarre situation of a three-way tie, where me, Tyler, and Sari have all come out on top of one person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being you worked brave. so hard on this game, Sam, <laughs> and to do to reward you, we crushed you. Oh. <laughs> there's a there's a trivia tiebreaker. One of the big leaps in watchmaking technology was the first use of quartz crystals in the design. These watches work by using a small piece of quartz as a tuning fork so that as an electric current passes through the crystal, the frequency of the quartz's vibrations gets converted very accurately into time. One of the early quartz timepieces was the Seiko Crystal Chronometer QC951 which ended up being used in the Olympics to time longer races. In what year was the mm. Crystal Chronometer's Olympics debut? Mm. Oh, my God. I have no idea. It could be literally any time after <laughs> electricity. <laughs> <Anytime>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't even know when electricity was, Hank. I'm not good at I history. All, I'm also <laughs> a little iffy. It was spread out. It wasn't all at once. Everybody says... Yeah. I'm going to throw my number out there and just trust that the universe is guiding me on this. That's right. Um, Yes. I I just feel like a lot of crazy shit happened in the 20s. 1921 Mm. feels like just a good year Mm. for some crazy crystal timekeeping shit to happen. Going by Seiko Crystal Chronometer QC951, that sounds like something that an ad executive did in 1964. I'm going to go earlier. I think this was an innovator who knew modern branding before it was a thing. And it is the 18, it was 18, the 1870s. Oh, I have no idea what the answer is. <laughs> it just got pasted in. Did I say 1964? Did yeah. I do it on the nose? Hey. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you are oh. advertising oh. marketing to a T. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. I mean, it also had to be some point after which Japan had industrialized um, and was mm-hmm. once okay. again. Uh, so, but anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's not make fun of Sari. Yeah. <laughs> so the answer was 1964. The answer was 1964, which is that I, I knew that it was an Olympics year. I did the math to check if it was an Olympics year. But other than that, mm-hmm. uh, cool. Well, I guess I win. And now it's time to ask the Science Couch where we've got a a listener question for our uh, couch of finely honed scientific minds. Sam, what do we got? No one on YouTube asks, why do quartz watches claim to be more accurate? What is it about crystals that make them special in electromagnetism? Ooh, well, it's cool that we had to do the bonus trivia question because we actually got to talk about that some because otherwise I would have literally said that it's like how you get like less friction in the watch or something. I have no idea. Like I, I, I learned that in real time just now. Sari, what do we got? Yeah. Um, so even mechanical watches use crystals, just not as the timekeeping piece. Um, yeah. A mechanical watch uses a mechanism. There are a lot of different pieces. That's why there are horologists. I'm not one of those. I would love to be, There's some great YouTube channels where they take apart watches and put them back together. And when I had COVID, I watched so many. (laughs) Uh Uh, The Repair Shop is one of my favorite Netflix shows. It's just a bunch of old people that come together and have their special... Anyway, uh, (laughs) so a mechanical watch works with you wind a mainspring and that 
has a bunch of like a series of gears and other little pieces in it. And the the part that ticks and sets the the timing of the watch makes the seconds pass is called the escapement. And the escapement is uh, the moving component of the watch. And it's what you hear tick inside of it, uh, like a wristwatch, as opposed to a grandfather clock, because that's the pendulum. Yeah. Um, and it sometimes uses jewels like rubies or sapphires to reduce wear and tear or absorb shock, because over time, with temperature changes, with with just inevitable friction, the escapement and the way that it moves is going to get a little bit jammed up and the timekeeping aspect of it is going to get thrown off a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the difference between quartz watches and mechanical watches is the fact that there's a little quartz crystal in it and the specific property that quartz has. Other crystals have it too, but quartz is just very plentiful, very cheap. Uh, We've been able to study it a lot and know exactly how to cut it in specific shapes. Quartz has a property called piezoelectricity. So if you squeeze a quartz crystal, then it generates a very small um, potential difference. It produces a voltage on the surface relative to the inside. And so if Mm. you apply an electric current to quartz, then it will deform shape. So like it goes both ways. If you So like if you squish, squish it, it produces electricity. So if you give it electricity, it like unsquishes. It squishes or bends, yeah. Yeah. And oh, so it, extremely weird, very cool. Um, it was first observed by Pierre and Jacques Curie in the 1880s. Um, but because the voltage was so low, we didn't have a practical application for it. Um, but then wristwatches are so small. We were like, what if we incorporate into an electronic component and quartz crystals, as opposed to a metal escapement are less affected by things like temperature and wear over time. Mm -hmm. So they are more accurate over longer periods of time. As long as you don't have like you cut it right. And there aren't impurities that would affect the resonant frequency of that quartz. You said, uh, inevitable friction and i thought that's a cool book title that i think that's a cool (laughs) book title (laughs) that is one thing we know that there is no (laughs) friction with system everything is always a little bit hard at least (laughs) this is a sexy sexy book (laughs) 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 difficult everything is always a little bit difficult Inevitable <laughs> friction. I like it. <laughs> if you want to ask the Science Couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we'll tweet out topics for upcoming episodes every week, or you can join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on our Discord. Thank you to Cryptid and James on Discord and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. Thank you, Tyler. If we want to see more of what you're up to, what what's the What's the top five things we should do? <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, I'm on Instagram, um, or you can go to tylerthrasher.com. Um, I grow crystals on bugs. I also synthesize and grow opals in my lab. Um, I will make fun of your dying plants. Um, it's all love. <laughs> it's all good. Um, <laughs> um, I also do some Dungeons and Dragons. And um, yeah, I don't know. I like to explore caves. So if you're into any of wow. those things, then check me out online um and thank you guys for having me this has been um, a a, a hilarious blast like my cheeks hurt this has been absolutely (laughs) great (laughs) that's great thank you so much for being here it was a super pleasure to have you if you like this show people listening out there and you want to help us out it's very easy to do that you can go to patreon.com slash scishow tangents become a patron get access to things like our newsletter and our bonus episodes and we have a tier where you can get a special in episode shout out which is the tier that patron john pollock subscribed at thank you john second you can leave us a review wherever you listen that helps us know what you like about the show also helps other people find us and finally if you want to show your love for scishow tangents just tell people about tell people people about about us. us Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sari Riley. I've been Sam Schultz. And I'm Tyler Thrasher. 
SciShow Tangents, created by all of us and produced by our invisible Sam Schultz. Our editor is Seth Glixman. Our story editor is Alex Billow. Our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bazayo. Our editorial assistant is Tabuki Chakravarti. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmeister and me, Hank Green. And of course, we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. But one more thing, makeup manufacturers can use guanine crystals, also known as pearl essence, to make shimmery goos. And the molecule guanine, which we now know is one of the nucleotide bases that make up our DNA, was first extracted from bird poop. That's how it got its name, from guano. Uh, (laughs) This linguistic connection led to the myth that sparkly makeup was made from poop. And while some animals, like mites, do poop out crystalline guanine, the guanine that ends up in makeup is usually extracted from fish scales instead. Ah, so it's not, it's not, I just assumed it was. I honestly was, we'll use anything. I always really thought it will. was poop. I thought it was poop this whole time. <laughs> I would wear poop makeup. I think that would be an appeal to me. You, you know, it's sanitary. Like by that point, at that point. Because when, we you've know it's the sanitary. That's an interesting <laughs> no, sentence, at- Sari. At the point where you've made a guanine, like extracted a guanine crystal, it's gone oh, through okay. so much like yeah, mo- right. molecular. I'm like, you I'm not well. just going to smear poop on my face, but like guanine crystals derived from bat guano, that would be a selling point. Look at this bat poop makeup. I can see Sari at a house party. Me being specifically. Like, <laughs> yeah, do, you, do you know? <laughs> I'm going to start the new multi level marketing scheme, but with poop makeup. I would invest in that. You should do yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs>